There we go. Okay, uh, that was exam four. Next one will be on your chapters six and seven. Brown, okay. The book I'm using and the PowerPoints that go with it. Mine is chapter seven and that covers everything in six and seven of yours. <clears throat> so let's show on the road. Okay, we're going to get into the topic of atomic structure and the uh, <clears throat> the nice thing about that is it it dovetails very well into the periodic table. The periodic table is set up so that you can deduce much of the atomic structure from the way it's laid out. And that should become obvious as we proceed. Okay. Picking it up okay. Um, we're going to start off with a discussion of electromagnetic radiation, or light. <clears throat> and everybody's noticed that fireworks have different colors. Actually, some of the colors are easy to produce, and some of them are very difficult to produce. <clears throat> but each of the colors that you see in fireworks is due to uh, transitions of electrons in the various metals that are incorporated into the fireworks. We're going to see how that works in a minute. <clears throat> um, characteristics of electromagnetic radiation. All right. Um, and they're actually they're all three related to one another. The wavelength, which is given the Greek letter lambda, uh, is just um, when we when we look at a uh, a wave. And this is not actually physically how it, how it looks in space, but it's our representation. And this is this is time progressing that way. And this is um, basically the, the energy of the wave. So it goes up and then it goes down and it crosses this zero point. And the distance between one crest and the next crest is the wavelength. And the standard measure of wavelength in the SI system is meters. <clears throat> now you could take it, <clears throat> you could take these points anywhere along here. So we could take it from there to there, we could take it from here to here, do the same thing. Um, it's just easier to, you stay on one side of this energy level, it's easier not to make a mistake and go from here to here. That's only half a wavelength, okay? But between here and here is a whole wavelength, and that's in meters. The frequency, which we give the uh, Greek letter nu, in, in English it's nu. <clears throat> the frequency is, um, fix your eye on one position and watch it when this wave passes and the next crest comes, how long does it take? In seconds. No, excuse me. I'll take that back. Uh, actually, it's well, that's one way to, to uh, determine what it is, but when you express the value, it's how many waves pass that point in one second. Okay? And the standard to measure for that is the hertz. <coughs> Uh, and the Hertz just means waves per second. Uh, since wave is 
dimensionless. It doesn't have any meaning. Usually what you'll see is uh, this will be in meters. This will be in reciprocal seconds because it's in the denominator. Uh, and then the speed of light um, varies depending on the medium it's traveling through. But in a vacuum, uh, it's given the, the letter C, and it's equal to like 2.9969, something like that, meters per second. Let me see. Oh, seven nine. Usually when I can't remember it, I just say three. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Right. <laughs> that would be pretty slow light if it's only three meters per second. I'm sorry? On that, uh, on the power plus, it's 10 to the 8. Yeah, 10 to the 8. <laughs> meters per second. So, that's fast. And all three of these are related by one formula. It's just the speed of light equals the wavelength times the frequency. Okay. And since this is a constant, then if you know this one, you can calculate that. And remember, anytime you have a, a relationship of two variables that are products, it's an inverse relationship. So as one goes up, the other goes down. So as the wavelength gets shorter, frequency gets higher, and vice versa. Um, okay. So let's see if the units of measure work out. If this is meters per second, the wavelength is in meters, and the frequency is in reciprocal <coughs> seconds. Okay, so that works. Okay. So this is just an explanation, and you can see um, the frequency for this one is four cycles per second, four hertz. This one's eight hertz. And notice the wavelength is getting shorter as the frequency increases. There we go. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. in the real universe, not in the Star Trek universe. <laughs> um, and from, uh, actually, the longer wavelength, we've got it on the right here, and the shorter wavelength on the left. Uh, I'm going to give you another formula in a second that relates the frequency of the light to energy. Uh, but this will illustrate, well, I'm going to make a point. As you go from longer wavelength to shorter wavelength, the energy of the light increases. So gamma rays are the highest energy electromagnetic wavelength of waves that we have, or that we know of. And the lowest energy waves are radio waves out here. And in between, we run through, if we start from with visible, Notice the visible is just a very narrow part of the spectrum. So what we see is, is only a fraction of the, of the story. Uh, infrared is often called heat waves. Right? That's what makes you hot when you stand in the sun. It's not the ultraviolet, it's the, it's the infrared. That's also what keeps your french fries warm at McDonald's until they serve them. It's the infrared lamps. Uh, microwaves, that's what we nuke our food with. Uh, it's also used in uh, certain types of uh, radar, uh, in uh, communication. It used to be that um, these towers that you would see for communication purposes, not necessarily cell, time, cell towers, <coughs> But they would have uh, the broadcast antenna on top, and then right below it, you'd see another parabolic uh, antenna. And that was aimed 
at some receiver at some distance. And it would communicate with that receiver through microwaves. Whereas the, the other communication would be a different wavelength. So they would not interfere. And then radio waves, of course, is where we get our talk radio and tunes. The other end, <clears throat> ultraviolet radiation, you get a little higher energy. And uh, let me, let me, let's stop and go through the, the visible first. All right, so the red end is the lower energy, blue end is the higher energy. And the, uh, of course, you know all your, uh, your seven colors, Roy G. Bid, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, and uh, blue and violet. I don't know where the indigo is in here. I always miss it. <laughs> but uh, uh, let's see. But this is called ultraviolet because it's it's more energetic than the violet. So the last one's violet. This makes that ultraviolet. This is red. This so infrared is less than red. That's where the, the names come from. Um, and notice there's there's a wide range of wavelengths in the group. So, and they, for health purposes, they divide them up into A, uh, ultraviolet, UVB and UVA. I think one of them is more dangerous than the other one. Um, and your uh, sunblock is designed to block one more than the other. And sometimes your UV protection on your lenses is geared toward the more damaging one. X-rays, of course, that's how we know where you got a broken bone. <clears throat> and then gamma rays are really, really, really high energy. And of course, the one of the doomsday scenarios talks about a gamma ray burst from a, uh, a dying star. So we know they happen, or at least the theory says they happen. And if the and what happens when the star uh, destroys itself at the end, if it's the right size and the right composition, it sends out two gamma ray bursts from the poles. And if it happens to be aimed at you, they're, they're highly focused. If they're aimed directly at the Earth, then those gamma ray bursts will strip away our ozone layer and uh, the sun will burn us up. <laughs> uh, okay, so there's the electromagnetic spectrum, and I'm not sure why they stuck this one in there. Direct current through your pickle. The energy that you're putting into that pickle from the, the, the electrical source has to go somewhere. We can't create energy, can't destroy it. We can only convert it. So in this case, we've converted that energy into light by making the pickle glow. Oops, there we go. Okay. Um, when energy is gained or lost from an atom, it occurs in little packets, we call them quanta. And those packets can be calculated. Um, they're actually the energy that each one of those packets contain is proportional to the frequency, nu. So if you know the frequency, and h is a constant, Planck's constant. In fact, this, this is called Planck's equation. Um, then you can calculate how much energy. Of course, if this is in uh, reciprocal seconds, uh, and this one is in joules, which is the standard measure of, of energy, then this has to be in joules seconds, right? So the seconds cancel. But there's a number, and we'll give it to you in just a second. There it is. Now that, that quantum of energy, that packet of, of light is called a photon. So the energy of the photon is equal to Planck's constant times New. That's not a good rendition of new. There we go. <clears throat> so there's Planck's constant. And really it's it's derived from the energy 
and the frequency. So the number itself doesn't have any special significance except that that's just what it happens to be. So the energy is proportional to the frequency. So as the frequency goes up, the energy goes up. And that's what we saw with as the wavelengths get shorter, the frequency goes up, so the energy goes up. And uh, that should be contained in your useful information. You know, so you don't have to memorize it. <clears throat> the photoelectric effect is the ejection of electrons from a surface when light of sufficient frequency shines on it. For example, when red light is directed at a metal surface, no electrons are ejected. However, when blue light, which has a higher frequency, is directed at the metal surface, Electrons are ejected and a current flows through the wire as measured by the anteater. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, the mathematical explanation for the photoelectric effect was proposed by Albert Einstein. In fact, that was, I think that was his first paper. He was working at the patent office in Zurich, Switzerland. And, uh, you got a Nobel Prize for it. Everybody associates Einstein with E equals MC squared or relativity or something. But he got his Nobel for this one because he explained mathematically what was happening. <clears throat> uh, and the, the amount of energy it takes to eject that electron uh, is whatever is required. It, it's now, I better not go into that detail, but let's get back. That's physics. Just accept it. <clears throat> so, uh, Einstein did come up with E equals mc squared. You know, he, he proved that one, too. And he said the um, matter, the mass of matter, uh, is interchangeable with energy. And the constant that determines the conversion is the speed of light. So uh, that's why when you, uh, let's say you explode an atomic bomb, if you could collect all the mass that was left over from the bomb and, and don't include any of the mass that it picked up when it blew, then you would find that the mass that was left over after the bomb exploded would be less than it was when it started. And the energy that's given off by that explosion is equal to whatever mass you're missing was converted into energy. That's what that means. Um, and it, it fed the controversy <laughs> of the, the dual nature of light. There was one school of thought that says, um, light is energy. That's the end of it. No further discussion. And there's another group that said, no, light is a, is a particle. I mean, it's a real, it has mass. Yeah. Well, there was evidence for both sides. So they just finally had to say, all right, it's both. <laughs> we know that, uh, that light has mass because uh, we've tested um, solar sails in space. Set up a satellite and it unfurls a sail made out of this thin material, probably mylar. Really thin and it's got a reflective surface on it and uh, the, it opens up and the sunlight shines on it and the satellite that's attached to it accelerates. So we know that you don't get acceleration without mass that momentum. The momentum of the light is being delivered to the satellite by the sail. So we know that light has mass. Otherwise it wouldn't have momentum. Okay, um, now we're going to get to uh, a discussion of light and the, the clues that it gives us toward the structure of the atom. And that has to do with the with light spectrum. I think I've got a couple of 
videos there. Uh, first definition, a continuous spectrum is like the one that we showed up there a few minutes ago with, uh, with the different categories. Uh, it was just straight across, color color, just back to back, color color, um, other parts of the spectrum. There are no breaks at all. That's a continuous spectrum. And that's basically what you get from the sun. Continuous, you just take a prism, you know, you can adjust it to where you shine it on the ground and you see continuous color spectrum. The other type is a line spectrum. Um, and the, the first one that was noticed was hydrogen. It was the easiest one to explain, let's just say that. It may not have been the first one that was noticed, but it was more difficult to explain the others. So we go to hydrogen because it's so simple. It's got one proton, one electron. But the line spectrum only produces discrete colors, just single lines at predictable wavelengths. It's known as an emission spectrum. Now, every element has its own emission spectrum. Uh, we used to use that characteristic in a, uh, a device that I, I used to analyze uh, elements in uh, uh, digested samples. It's called a uh, uh, inductively coupled argon plasma spectrometer, which just means the sample is sucked up into a really hot flame, like 10,000 Kelvin, which is, uh, and if the flame was, it really wasn't a flame, but the torch <laughs> was composed of argon gas that we sprinkle a little ion in there so it would uh, couple with a magnetic field. We have this coil around it, uh, very high energy, just the right frequency vibration that would couple with the argon and heat it up. So then we shoot the sample up into that argon and it just rips it apart and tears all the electrons off the atoms. Then in the upper part of the flame, as it cools down, those electrons start to return. When they do, they give off light of uh, characteristic wavelengths for each element. So we just focus on one that's prominent and easy to detect and less likely to interfere or be interfered with others. And you can determine uh, 20 or 30 elements just like that if, you're, if your instrument's tuned correctly and calibrated properly. And I got a book that's about that thick and it's just pages and pages of elements and their characteristic wavelengths. <laughs> so you don't have to sit down and do calculations to it. I mean, it's right there. <clears throat> and really calculations, you can't do those type of calculations on um, polyelectronic ele elements because the transitions are, they interfere with one another and they produce really weird spectra. So the only one that you can really calculate well is hydrogen because it's only got one electron there's nothing else in there to interfere with it. Light and light that is passed through a prism separates into a rainbow or continuous spectrum consisting of colors from violet to red. That could be a little louder. Good, wrong one. Uh, yeah, there it is. There. Let's try that again. Wavelength that is passed through a prism separates into a rainbow or a continuous spectrum consisting of colors from violet through red. Speakers can't handle it. So let's go back to. Okay. When the light emitted by a hydrogen gas discharge tube is passed through a prism, a line spectrum results. This line spectrum consists of light at only clearly placed in the visible region. Now, what's the significance of those? lines in the spectrum. 
Each line relates to an energy transition of the electron in the space outside the atom. It's what we call quantized. In other words, it can only move between certain energy levels. It can't go in between anywhere. It has to go. So the transition then is from one energy level to the next, or maybe deeper into the atom. And the wider the transition, the shorter the wavelength, higher the energy, higher the frequency. Okay. And it can be calculated. Okay, they say it better. Only certain energies are allowed for the electron in the hydrogen atom. Uh, okay, so why is it significant that color emitted from the hydrogen emission is not white? Oops. And how does the emission spectrum support the idea of quantized? Well, I already said that. I'm wasting time with that. Unless you have questions. You can always stop. Okay, so the model of the atom, now we're getting to theory. We're going to explain why those colors are where they are, and only four. In the visible range. Now there's some in in the uh, non-visible area that relate to other transitions, but in the visible range, uh, hydrogen only has those four. The, the model that we're going to refer to is that was developed by uh, a Danish scientist uh, named Niels Bohr, and um, uh, it, it's the Bohr model, and actually. Uh, Niels Bohr modeled his uh, atom and the electrons around it after planetary systems. He just said, well, I don't know where to start, so I'll start here. I'll model it after a planet. It's kind of like modeling your airplane after a bird. So he said, the uh, sun is like the nucleus, and planets are like the electrons, and they, they stay in these orbits. And they can only move between those orbits, nothing in, in the middle. They have to go either from this one to that one, from this one to that one, or vice versa. So that was the, the Bohr model. Um, another convention for uh, the Bohr model, and actually from any atom now, still, is the nucleus is here. And then you have these levels, energy levels, number them like that. Notice the lowest number is down here by the nucleus. So the energy of an electron is always relative to its position outside the nucleus. In other words, the closer it is to the nucleus, the lower its energy. So when you add energy to an electron, if it's here, and it goes up to here, you have to add enough energy to make it go that distance. So the higher the number, the higher the energy, and the further away from the nucleus it is. That's generally true. Oh, and you can't get any closer than this energy level. Um, now, for the, for the hydrogen atom, right, the ground state is in energy level one because it only has one electron, and it's most stable, happiest, when its electron is in that level. If it moves to any of these others, it's an excited state. Okay, now on a chart, you notice that the ground state is here, and energy-wise, there's a big difference, a uh, distance that it has to travel between one and two. And then the distances get narrower and narrower as you move out. So actually, these distances here are not accurate. It should be one should be uh, right here, and then two should be way out here, and then three, and then four, and five. Right. So to scale, that's not accurate. I'm gonna still take another one down. Okay. So that's the Bohr model, and. We can identify those four wavelengths by the transitions that those electrons make. So 
uh, if an electron moves from uh, a higher orbital to a lower orbital, it gives off light, gives off that energy. It's going from higher to lower, so it's got to get rid of the energy somehow, and it does so as a photon of light. Okay. Right, more energy like the one, but it's less energy as it goes. No. Right? No, opposite. Less energy here, more, more energy, energy here. Okay. Right. So if it goes in, it lets off light. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Moving in, it lets off the light. So I should say the electron going from here to there lets off light. Okay. If we promote the electron, then what we've done is we shine light on it and it moves, it absorbs the light, it moves to whatever energy level is appropriate for that amount of energy. And that's with any atom, not just hydrogen? Yeah, any, yeah. anyone. Uh, we can't calculate very well for the others. We can calculate for hydrogen very well, but the same process happens no matter what atom it is. Okay, so the, the four um, wavelengths, uh, they're only showing three here, so there's got to be a transition down to one to give you four wavelengths. Right. What? Um, okay, we're illustrating this one also. Notice that arrow is red, this one's green, and that one's blue. So that's lower energy, a little higher energy, even higher energy than that. Okay. So the wider the transition, the more energy is given off and the shorter the wave, higher the frequency. Okay. Because the, the shorter wavelength with the higher frequency carries more energy in a photon. Oops. Okay. I'm not why there's not showing the fourth one. It should. So if we're going from uh, five Actually, the transition they showed us on the previous one is not is not the same as this one. So there's oh they're saying this one is one. They're not showing us the nucleus. Okay, I thought this was the nucleus. That's the first energy level. All right. So we we got three wavelengths here. It's just missing the fourth one. So it's missing this one right here. That should still be in the visible range. So what may be, uh, I don't know what it would be. We can calculate it. You know, if you know the wavelength, you can calculate the frequency, and uh, and you can also calculate the energy. Then the energy of the transition goes right in here, and you can calculate. But you can propose, if you know which energy level it ends up on, then you can find out where it started from. Or if you know where it started from, you can find out where it ends to give you that energy. Um, and I didn't show you a couple of transitions, I mean, uh, equation manipulations. Remember, if you have speed of light and you have um, wavelength and frequency, then if you have also Planck's equation like that, then if you need to know energy and you have wavelength, then you would solve this one for that. Find out what the frequency is and plug it in here. Or just take this, plug it in there, and you get energy equals And just do it in one step. Okay, if you know the wavelength, then that's what you would use. Um, okay, so this is if you know, if you've detected and identified the exact wavelength or frequency of the light that's being emitted, then you can tell what its energy is, and then you can substitute that in here. And then you just need to know one of these, and you can find the other one. Or if you know the transition, then you can find out how much energy is and compare that to maybe a wavelength that you have and 
tubes are spot on. There are a whole number of things you can do. Um, so this N is that whole number that's assigned to each of the energy levels. Um, one thing they don't show you in these slides, it might be in your textbook, is a modification. Actually, this is a modification for the hydrogen atom. Right? That one refers to one proton. Okay. You can use this equation for non-hydrogen atoms, but the atom has to be hydrogen-like, which means it can only have one electron. It can have all the protons you want. So we could take, uh, say, uh, lithium, which has three protons and three electrons. You have to strip off two of them. Then you can do these transitions with the lithium uh, atom in that ionized state. And you just substitute up here how many protons there are. So you put three here and three here. Then you could do the same calculations for lithium rather than hydrogen. It's just that you can only have one electron surrounding the, and sometimes that's hard to do. So then say carbon, you'd have to get rid of five electrons. You know, that takes a lot of energy. We're gonna talk about that a little later. We've got time. Are there always five energy levels? No, no, there's, there can be more, right? Those, um, you get to a point where the, the difference between them is so narrow, and also you get to a point off the, where you have like five, six, seven, eight, nine, where the electron is effectively not associated with the atom anymore. It reaches infinity, okay? In some calculations, um, you use infinity, right? So if the initial was, uh, let's see, if it's coming, if it's an ionized hydrogen atom and that electron is coming from infinity to level one, then the final position would be one here, uh, minus one divided by infinity. So what's one divided by infinity? Zero, right? Remember from math, you divide anything by infinity, you get zero. Um, or vice versa. Any number divided by zero is infinity. So that term drops out. So if you've got an ionized hydrogen, like you've got a proton, and you've got these electrons out here at infinity, and they go down to level one, then you can calculate the uh, energy that is given off when that happens. Uh, simply by dropping that term out and then just saying this is one, one. So actually it would be um, this term right here. The energy transition would be uh, minus two times 10 to the minus 18 joules for that one electron. Uh, oh, that brings up another topic, okay? If you're going from a high number here, right here, to a low number here, that means that this one divided by the big number makes it smaller. So this is going to be positive, this term, when an electron is returning. Makes this positive, so that's negative. That means uh, the energy transition is negative. So the way I interpret that is, if you have an atom here, treat it like your uh, thermal chemistry system where you have, this is your system, and if light's leaving the system, it's gonna be negative in energy. And if light is arriving at the system, it's gonna be positive. Okay. And that's, I think that's why this equation has a negative sign here, to maintain that convention. So is that a constant? This one? Yes, that's uh, Planck's constant. I think. No, that's not Planck's constant. Uh, I don't know what it is. Is it in your is it in your textbook? It's not in the slides. Let me see if I still have my textbook up. Uh, no, 
Oh, no. Just give me a second. And I don't know if I have your textbook, so I'm going to I'm going to pull mine up. It's good. Here's mine. This chapter. Okay. So, one number, four, model, four, five. Okay. See that? That's kind of small, isn't it? Uh, okay, there's. Electric effect would be that one. It's a constant, I just, I just don't know what to call it. Here we go. Getting close. I think that constant is a, uh, is a composite of several constants. Sometimes they do that. So this one's not given a name. Will it be implicit on the useful information page? Oh, yeah. Okay. Should be on all that. Yeah. They find it. I see uh, fonts. Fonts constant? Yeah, well, I don't see that it might, it might not be a constant. It might be in the equation itself. It is. Yes. Yes. All right. There it is. That's it. All right. And that's this is the energy for an electron at a given level. Right. That's what that means. Mm -hmm. The energy of that electron for that level is there. And if you want delta v, then you subtract one from the other. That's why. Um, huh? That's what this means. Yes. Delta. Oh yeah. Here we go. So if you substitute this one in each one of these with its appropriate values here, then you get the one that's in your slides. So that's where it comes from. I get it. Thank you. Okay. All right, let me go back to our slideshow. <coughs> uh, let's see. Oh, that's not it. There it is. Okay, go on again. Yeah, I need a better explanation for that rather than just throwing it up on the board. So here's an example. If your transition is from n equals 5 to n equals 2, so it's coming from a higher to a lower, that means it's going to give off light. Um, and the wavelength is 434 nanometers, then you can calculate um, the energy of that wavelength. Okay, we're not going to in incorporate, uh, or are we? Oh, okay. We're doing two calculations here just to see if they agree with one another. So, this is one calculation where we use the, um, the transition energy. Right, so the final would be N equals. Two, and this is n equals five. It's going to be five to two, initial to final. So we can calculate the number of joules, and, and this is the number of joules for that transition, ten to the minus nineteen. Then, if we take that wavelength, because that's the wavelength of the light that's emitted, and we calculate uh, the energy. So we're going to use that Planck's constant times speed of light divided by wavelength. And there's Planck's constant. And this is uh, the wavelength in meters. Right? It has to be meters. It's given as nanometers. So what's a nanometer? Right? <laughs> um, let's use that example. 434 nanometers is the wavelength. Right? So if it has to be meters, I just take 434 times 10 to the minus ninth. 
meters. Okay? 10 to the minus 9th meter is a nanometer. Then if you want to, you can move the decimal place like that. So that's where this one came from. In this position right here, there it is, in meters. And then there's the speed of light. Do the calculation and you end up with the same number of joules, roughly, as this calculation. So that just confirms that the electron transition says it should be this amount of energy, and the light we received says it should be that amount of energy, and they agree. Okay. So here we go. So far, so good. Okay. The good things about the Bohr model, at least for the hydrogen atom, the model correctly fits the quantized energy levels. Uh, and agrees with uh, the transition states that are allowed. And that's, that's a common term in uh, quantum mechanics, which is the, an outgrowth of this. What's allowed? <laughs> that just means it's statistically based. Um, so as the electrons become more tightly bound, that is, um, that they become close, they are closer to the atom, then the energy they have is more negative. Relative to the free electron. Right? So at infinity, the energy of the electron relative to the atom is zero. So as it gets closer, as it drops into these different levels, it becomes more negative. When it says more tightly bound, it just means getting closer to the nucleus, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And you see the effect of that tight binding as a release of energy in the form of light. So it's all a balancing act. Now, what the Bohr model doesn't do is it's not able to predict um, anything other than hydrogen or hydrogen-like atoms. Any, any polyelectronic atoms, uh, it just completely falls apart. And it also, it also says that electrons move in circular orbits, and they don't. They, are, they occupy a space. And it might be here, but it might also be over here or over here. But it's in this region. Uh, okay, so uh, the question, what color of light is emitted when an excited electron in the hydrogen atom falls from 5 to 2, 4 to 2, 3 to 2? Well, you can do the calculation, just use that formula, and then you can compare the, the wavelength that you get with the uh, Roy G. Biff spectrum and say what color is it. Um, we're not going to do that. It takes too long. But which transition results in the longest wavelength? We can do that one without any calculations. The longest wavelength means lowest energy. Right? Long wavelength means uh, small frequency. And small frequency means low energy. So the low energy is the one where the transition is the narrowest. So if we go from five to two, that's a big jump. Four to two is an intermediate jump, and lesser is three to two. So the, the longest wavelength should be three to two. It's the lowest energy. Okay, that's gonna be the lowest energy. The, the narrowest transition 
is the least amount of energy or the longest wavelength. The hardest part about this right now is wrapping your head around the, the convention. Which way is which? Okay. Um, now, why is it that we can't we can't know where the electrons are? Heisenberg explained that in his uncertainty principle. Um, you don't have to remember this part. I'm just put that up there for illustration purposes and, and description. The um, Heisenberg said that um, there is a limit to knowing where something is and how fast it's going. That's if you can tell one, you can't tell the other with any degree of accuracy. And that's more pronounced as the size of the particle gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So at the atomic level, uh, it's impossible to know both the, the position which is represented by X here, and the uh, speed. So that's not a new, that's a velocity. Okay. Now, the way he put it, the words, of course, he, he had to use words that his colleagues were familiar with and that were provable. So the way he said it was, uh, here's the uncertainty in the particle's position, or delta X. So the bigger that value, the more uncertain you are as to where it is. And this is m mass times velocity is momentum. So you can't know the momentum and this one with any degree of certainty both at the same time. And this is the limit. Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. Oh, by the way, yesterday was pi day. Do you know that? Which what kind of pi? Yeah. Like Apple? Math pi or like easy pi? No, math pi. Oh. <laughs> you know, the irrational number. Um, okay, so uh, if, if this is, that's a constant, so this term has to be a constant, right? Planck's constant is constant, so divide by 4 pi, it's got to be a constant too. So that's, that constant sets the limit. Uh, this value has to be greater than or equal to that. Can't be less than. Right? So if, if it's uh, constrained by this constant, that means that as the mass gets smaller, small, 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 small mass, then uh, if this is really small, then that one's got to be really big. Or if this one's really big, that one has to be really small. Um, now to put this in perspective, um, why don't we have the same trouble with like you and me? Right? You can see where I am. You can see how fast I'm moving, which is zero right now. It's all that right there. When the mass is huge, then this this uh, uncertainty of position uh, is relatively large. I mean, the momentum is relatively large. Then the change in position is relatively small. So that's why you can find where I am. Because it has to be equal to or greater than that number. So if this is huge, that number right there is really small. That's why you can tell where I am right now, because I'm big relative to an atom. But it works. I mean, this wasn't just for atoms. I mean, it was most useful, you know, for explaining things, Heisenberg and atoms and transitions and electrons, but it works just as well for large masses too. So if the mass is really big, it's easy to find out where I am. Okay. You don't have to know what this one is either. That's the Greek letter psi, P-S-I. Um, and it just, we just use that value in quantum mechanical formulas to express the probability of finding an electron in any particular space. So um, this, actually the square of psi is, the, is part of the function that indicates the probability of finding an electron at any place. 
So we can't say it's there, but we can say there's a high probability that it's there, 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 there. It's in that region. Okay. That's the way we have to deal with electrons because of Heisenberg's principle. Now, once you take that, that function and plot it, then it looks something, well, depending on how you plot it, it looks something like this. So if this is right here, so this is where the nucleus is, and then you get farther from the nucleus as you move out. So for uh, 1s, we've done electronic configurations yet. We haven't done that yet. Okay. So we are. We are going to do that. 1s just means it's at the first energy level, and it has an orbital that's shaped like a sphere. Then, as you get farther away, you're less likely to find the electron out there. That's all that means. Oops. So, um, let's see. Are we still talking about the one S? It didn't say. Okay. I think I need to go on anyway because we're starting to use terminology that we haven't even defined yet. Yeah. So, you know, it might pay to skip to that point and then come back to this. Let's do that. Here we go. Quantum numbers. Okay, this is how we describe um, the probability of finding an electron. Uh, the description of an electron's position in the space around an atom is defined by four numbers. Okay? The first one is the principal quantum number, N. We've already seen that one in the Bohr atom. One, two, three, four, five, six. And it's always a whole number, starting with one. So N can be any one of these. The second number is L. So N can be one, two, three, four. Now I'm going to write L out here because L can be a sublevel of any one of these. Right, we're, we're drilling down through the energy levels. Uh, L can be, you can have as many L levels as you have whole numbers here. So if you're one, you can only have one L level. And it's L minus one is where you start. Right? So we start here. For that one, L, you only have one, that's it. If you're in the second energy level, like move further away from the atom, then you can have zero or one, two possible L levels. If you move out to the third level, you can have a zero, one, and two. So it's always n minus 1 is the maximum. 0, 1, 2. And that just keeps going up however you need. Now, this is the, the principal quantum number. This is the uh, magnetic quantum number. This one refers to uh, energy of the electron and size of the orbital. <clears throat> okay. This one refers to the shape. Right. So if it's zero, the shape is spherical. Spherical. If it's one, it's kind of like a dumbbell. No. B U N B. Yeah. And twos and higher, they, they get really complex. So I'm not going to bother trying to try those. <clears throat> um, oh, I, I'm sorry, I skipped one. That's the wrong name. This is angular momentum. Well, at least you guys are consistent. All my classes are that way. They should let me stand up here and make mistakes. 
Just watch. Makes a good show, I guess. This part is right. The name was wrong. So the principal quantum number, the angular, is the shape of the orbital. The magnetic quantum number is the orientation in space. Right? So on the XYZ axis, it could be like. X, Y, and Z. So Z goes back into the board. So it could be pointing this way, it could be pointing that way, or that way, or it could be in between. Um, that's what the magnetic quantum number means. Now, we're still drilling down through our levels. So I'm going to move the, the uh, M sub L over here, because it's a subset of, of each one of these, and these are subsets of each one of those. There's a reason for this. It's, it's the way we build the electronic structure of an atom. So we have to need these sublevels. So within these, you can have uh, minus L up to plus L. Right? So if you have a zero here, zero is it. That's all you can have. If you have a one, you can have a minus one, zero, and one. If you have two, you can have minus two, minus one, zero, one, two. Okay? That's what that means. So let's take, for example, this one. That would be minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. Okay? Possible for that level, for two. And then the last one is the easy one. The electron spin. This one is either uh, plus a half, plus a half, or minus a half. That's it. And that's at each one of these levels, you can have a plus a half or a minus a half. Each one. Okay? So those are the four quantum numbers. Now, these numbers are not arbitrary. They're chosen, these values are chosen so that they can go into a formula and produce that, that psi squared uh, probability. I never messed with it. I'm not going to start now. <laughs> I just need to know how this works. So here's an example. All right. There's N1234, possible L levels 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, right? from, uh, from 0 up to n minus 1. And then the n sub L levels for each of those possible levels. And this tells you how many possible orbitals you have at each one of those levels. Now, for uh, the convention, when we start um, laying out the electronic structure for an atom, um, those numbers don't fit the system very well. So there's an alternate, um, let's see. Okay, I'm going to start from scratch here. The, the one, of course, is still there. The N number, quantum number N. We always keep that. But the, the L number, the zero refers to S P D and L. That's as high as we go. That's as high as you get on the periodic table. So we just stop there. So zero, one, two, and three is really all you have to go for the the uh, L. So for hydrogen, you only need the very lowest one, the very first one. So it'd be one S. Right. And we write the electron up here. There. It's only got one electron. So it's in that orbital, 1s. 1s1 is hydrogen. Um, okay. Let's move on. <clears throat>
But let's see if we understand this. Say we have a principal quantum number of n equals 3. How many subshells are allowed? Okay, they're saying this is the, the energy shell level, primary energy level, then subshell. So we're talking about L only. So uh, determine the number of allowed subshells, different values of L. Oh, got the answer already. Well, okay, it's equal to three, right? L can be zero, one, two, that's it. And minus one is the highest one, okay? Uh, let's see. Oh, I'll give the designation of each, okay. So this would be 3S, 3P, 3D, SPD. <clears throat> so let's take um, L equals 2. So if L equals 2, then we can, it doesn't matter what this is. If we just focus on L equals 2, um, what are the quantum numbers that are available? Well, remember, for the for the m sub l's, that's what we're talking about. What are the possible m sub l's for n equal to? Oh, we've already done that. Minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two. That's it. So you can have within two, you can have five. Five magnetic quantum number levels. So what does two refer to? Two is D. So two is referring to D. An S particle has a spherical shape with the nucleus at the center. That's an artist rendition. <laughs> Oops. The two NPX orbitals, the shape of the Mac clan, the three, the three D, D, all of them. They're really sensitive. The two PZ orbital is in the shape of the theory along the Z axis. Okay. So for the P, and we're going back to uh, N equals 2. So that means L can be 0 and 1. So that means this is S and this is P. Right? So the 2P can have, uh, P can have, let's see, if L equals 2, no, L equals 1. So if L equals 1, how many M sub L's can we have? Remember, uh, L is the shape and M is the orientation in space. So we can have M sub L's can be uh, zero. Wait a minute. Yeah, zero. Oh, shoot. Can be one, zero, minus one, zero, plus one. So we can have three. So that's why they're talking X, Y, and Z. So two P can have two P X, and two P Y. 2p z and that like this one of them goes like that one goes like this one goes like that okay i don't know which one's minus one zero and plus one but they're they're all there okay they're oriented along the axis for each one this one's on the z axis okay so there's your P's. Um, we usually don't write them that way when we start putting electrons in. We usually just write 2P, and then we put the total number of electrons in there. And I'll show you how those fill up in just a minute. So don't panic yet. 
x squared has like a vertical, has a vertical root shape that lies on the x1 plane and is aligned along the x and y axes. So are these like hypothetical hydrogen ions? Like what with these are um, probability distributions of electrons and we're not just talking about hydrogen anymore we're talking about anyone well not anyone but the appropriate element in the table that needs to use those orbitals for its electrons right. we're talking about just about the quantum theory the, the quantum expression of electron position. So now we're talking about D's, right? So L equals two. And that means you can have minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two. You can have five possible orientations. This is one of them, the x squared y minus y squared. The three D X Y logo has a little shape that lies in the X Y plane and it bisects the X and Y axes. These are all developed by the quantum mechanical model, and these are theoretical positions, uh, regions of space, where you might find electrons occupying that orbital. Right? It could be anywhere in there. The three D density orbital has a closed leaf shape that lies in the XZ plane and bisects the X and the Z axes. This is just fun to watch. It really doesn't matter that much. The three D density orbital has a closed leaf shape that lies in the X and the Z axes. I don't know what emphasis they put on it. And bisects the Y and Z axes. So, um, on test, or we want to do it, we're talking about like. Because I know that we have names, you know what I mean, um, for their specific one. Or you're going to ask them questions on the heads. Like, what the name of the future is? No. Okay, like a tetrahedral or something. Um, I, here's your guide. And that's one of the reasons that I created the study guide. Focus on the study guide. If it's if it doesn't talk about anything like this in the study guide, just ignore it. The three D Z two orbital is shaped like a P Z orbital with a donut of electron density around the center. It is aligned with the Z axis. I think that's ridiculous. Yeah, because it doesn't it doesn't help you understand anything about the chemistry. No, it's, not unless you're going to be a chemist. I think the only thing that might help you understand is like learning the name will help you understand how much, like, I don't really know how to explain it. Like a trigonal bipyramidal, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It has five numbers. Yes. Now, okay, now that could, yes. Like explain. Yes. The name will help you know how many there is. Yeah, that's true. But we approach it from a different I mean, we just we just learn what they are. If you have five, it's going to be this. Period. Okay. So the F's. Let's see. S. E. D. F. Where the L is equal three, you can have seven possible. Three, four, five, six, seven. Now the total number of available. Orbitals does help us explain some things, and we'll talk about that when we get to the periodic table. Back up. Okay, now the electron spin. Um, for uh, each m sub l, you can have a plus half or a minus a half. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you that. Um, what, no, here it is. The Pauli exclusion principle. This set of four quantum numbers is unique to each electron. No two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers. They could have uh, they could have N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. They could have the same here, and then they could have, the, uh, let's see, let's make this one 
one. And then M sub L would be, uh, let's say it's zero. And this could be plus one half. So the second one could have the same ones here. That means it has to have a different one down here. Or they could vary up here. But they can't have the same set. That's the poly exclusion principle. Now, once you get down to this level, once you've identified your M sub L orbital, then that orbital can only hold two electrons. One of them has to be this, one of them has to be that. If there are two of them together, they have to be opposite speed. I hope that'll be obvious in just a second. Oops. Uh, okay. All right. This just says that when we start building atoms, if say we have to put uh, six electrons in that atom, they go in at the lowest energy first and you build up in energy. You start at the low and you build up until you run out of electrons. That's all that means. So this is, this is one way to look at uh, energy levels. Like 1s is going to be low energy. The 2s and 2p's, um, theoretically, the 2 number, the quantum, quantum principal quantum number, defines the energy level. But once you start putting more electrons in there and more protons in the nucleus, then they start to shift a little. But they're in the same general vicinity. Back up. It's not going to start on the phone. Behave. So let's move on. <clears throat> the concept of the penetration effect. Um, this just means that the probability of finding an electron uh, nearer the nucleus that is penetrating closer to the nucleus is more pronounced for the s orbital than it is for the p. It has a lot to do with the shape of the orbital. Since the s orbital is spherical, you know, with qualification, it's definitely spherical if it's if it's a one, n equals one. But if it's a two, it's kind of like it has shells. It has high density here, and you move out, it has another region of high density. But it's it's spherical in general shape. But the best way to show that is with this diagram. So once you get to the n equals 2, for the s orbital, uh, it's going to have one node. You know what a node is? A node is where you don't find anything. So the, the 2s orbital uh, is going to have some of its density out here beyond the 2p orbital. But it's also going to have a significant amount of density within the 2p orbital. That's the penetration effect. If we had a, a 3s, it would have two nodes. Right? It would have some here, and they'd go up here, and they have another one, and they go down, they could go up here, and another one. Okay. Oh, there it is, right there. So you get penetration with the s orbitals in particular. There you go. Um, so, and as you get higher in the quantum, quantum principal quantum number, you also get some penetration for the p's, right? But the s's still penetrate within the p's, and then the 3d, of course, the n equals three. That's the first place that the d appears. Right? So you don't know, find it in the ones and twos. You still get penetration. All right, now let's try to make sense of the periodic table, knowing what we know now about the uh, quantum numbers. Four. We got to end by five, don't we? Now, when we run out of time. Go ahead.
Okay. So let me see how far along am I? All right, I think we can move along. Um, I'll make this short. The periodic table developed over time, which is characteristic of, of scientific endeavors. You just add incrementally. And occasionally you get uh, somebody has a light bulb that just goes and they, they pull it all together and we make a big advance. But for the longest time, you just get little increments. So you get incremental, trying to arrange the elements in some sort of logical sequence, you know, how they relate to one another. So you get Dobreiner, who uh, developed his triads. Okay, he noticed that chlorine, bromine, and iodine, they behave similarly. But that's as far as he took it. You know. um, alkali metals, you could do the same thing, like lithium, sodium, potassium. They behave similarly too, triads. He had several of them. Um, then uh, uh, Lothar Meyer was German, and Mendeley, of course, was a Russian. And they toyed around with uh, a, a larger picture of how to organize the elements. So they grouped them together. Um, Meyer made some progress, but Mendeley gets the major share of uh, credit for the periodic table for two reasons. One is he grouped them according to uh, similar characteristics, similar chemical behavior. And if, uh, and, and as you increase the mass, uh, you go through a series and then you get to the end and say, there's nothing out here, so I gotta go back to the beginning. Well, that's good because when I go back to the beginning, that element lines up better with this group. But he didn't let that, he didn't let the weight tell him where to put the element. In other words, he, they get heavier and heavier and heavier, and at this time they didn't know anything about atomic numbers. So as they get heavier, say, okay, this one's supposed to be here, but it doesn't match up with that group. It matches up with one right next door, so he moved it over there and left that spot empty. And he said, okay, one of these days, that was the first reason. Second reason is one of these days, the element's going to be discovered that fits that slot. And it's going to look like this, and it's going to weigh about this much, yada, yada, yada. Sure enough, they found it. That's why Mendeleev gets credit, because he predicted. He used his table to predict the existence of elements that nobody had discovered and properly characterized them. Okay. Well, there we go. Now, how do we fill up an atom with electrons? Well, the neutral atom is going to have the same number of electrons as the number of protons. So once you know the number of protons, you know how many electrons go into the atom if it's neutral. And from there, you can make ions. And they're predictable making of ions. So this is the, a German word, Aufbau principle, just it's German for do it this way. <laughs> That's the way I always understand it. Um, so uh, for this example, we have the oxygen atom, right? So if we write oxygen, and it has uh, eight protons, I think. So that means it has eight electrons, right? So we start with the lowest energy, 1s. Then we move to the second level. So the second level can have S and P, right? And if we need, we can go further. If we get to three, then it has S, P, and D available. But oxygen's gonna run out before we get there. Right, so how do you fill it? Well, the first one's gonna have two electrons, and you fill up one energy level before you move to the next one. So it's two maximum for S's. So we have two more here. But P can have X, Y, and Z. Right? So that's six electrons. We have two more. So where do they go? Well, we use, I usually draw them with a single bar there. Right? The um, Hunt rule says 
you can't put them in there, even with opposite spins, until you fill up all the ones in that sublevel. So you have one, two, that's it. If we had more, then we could put another one here, and then if we had another one, then it'd go back in here, opposite spin. That's Hun's rule. I don't know if it's up there yet. Maybe it's coming. So that's oxygen. So oxygen is going to have two here. So it'd be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Oh, wait a minute, four. I thought I do that. Four. Sorry. Yeah, you are giving one that, aren't you? Two, four, six, eight. There we go. So it's going to be 2p6. That's the electronic structure for oxygen. Oh, there's Hun's rule. So when you fill up an atom with electrons, you always put the maximum unpaired possible before you start pairing. Right. So this one would be put three in, and then you can go back and pair. Well, how about D? Say we had D. How many possible do you have for D? Well, um, D is uh, let's see, zero, one, two. So D is two, so that means you can have minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. You can have five sublevels in D. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. So you do like that, like that, like that, like that. You have to have at least five, and then six in order to start pairing them up again. Okay. Um, okay, back to the alpha principle. That's oxygen. No, I, want, I don't want that yet. There. This is the easiest way to fill up your orbitals and get them right using this method. So if you put your ends down the side, right, and then you put in uh, your sublevels, so this can be 1s, that's it. That's all you can have. The 2s, you can have 2s and 2p. The 3s, you can have 3s, 3p, 3d. The 4s, you can have 4s, 4p, 4d, and 4f. And then 5s, 5d, 5d. That's about all you're going to need. You can go up to G. But then when you start filling them, you fill in a diagonal. Right? So you, you aim down like this, fill that one, then you fill that one, then you fill that one and that one. Right? 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s. Yes, that's right. Then you go back to 3D, 4P, 5S. So the order that you fill them is, oh, is this, this, this seems rather orderly in the beginning. One, two, two, three, three, S, three, P. But when you get to this one, uh, when you get here, you go from 3P to 4S, and then you go back to 3D. So you, this one is at a lower energy level than even 3D. Okay, once you start, once you start building the atom and getting all those protons in the nucleus, it shifts the energy levels so that the 4s is at a lower energy than the 3D. Okay, that's why this diagonal works. So what I do is. Is that in your uh, useful information? Sometimes it might be helpful in understanding because I haven't done it. It's on the periodic table. Yeah. The all seven is labeled on the side. Yeah. You need to explain the three S and four S. You go three S across through the A L to A R is three S. Oh, I skipped that. A and C A is four S. There it is. And three D starts at S C and C. This is the way the table's laid out. The principal quantum numbers are here. Yeah, I think that helps explain. Actually, these are period numbers. Yeah, I think that 
details of trying to look yeah. things. So you got um, this is only going to have one S. You can only have hydrogen and helium, just two, because they're two electrons. That's it. Yeah. And then the two S and the two P, you fill those up, then you fill up three S, three P. Three S, three P. And then when you get three P, you go back to four S. Then when you get past 4S, you're into 3D. Transition metals are fill up the D orbitals. Then you get over to 4P, which is here. Then when you get past 4P, you go to 5S, right here. Then you go back to 4D. So these, the periods are not, strictly speaking, uh, principal quantum movement. Because once you get over here, you're back to 4 rather than 5. You just have to know that uh, in this side, these two columns fill the S orbitals, these fill the, D, the P orbitals, these fill the P orbital, and these fill the Fs. And you just count them up, right? For the S's, you can only have two electrons in each S, right? One, two. That's it. For the P's, you can have six because you've got three levels and two each. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Then for the D's, you've got five levels with two each, so that's ten. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the structure of the table starts to appear. And then down here, S has seven, so you should have 14 elements in the list. Just like that. So, um, let's see if we can do the structure for I better leave that there. No, put it up there. Put it up here. For sulfur. So sulfur's got 16. Right? So if we put it in order that they're filled, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, and more if we need. So now we can start filling them up. Two in this one, two in that one, six in this one because it's a P, and two more in this one. Two, four, six, twelve. So we have four more. That's it. That's as far as you need to go. Now look back at the periodic table. Where is sulfur? Sulfur's right here. So it's in the third level. So this you fill up the three S two. And then the 3P, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3P, 4, 3P, 4. Now, the shorthand for doing this is you walk yourself back from here until you get to the nearest uh, noble gas. So walk back here, and then you go back up here. Neon. Neon's got 10. So you start with a neon structure, then you go to the next. 3s2, 3p6. Uh, 4, excuse me. So that's the shorthand. You've got the neon core structure plus these. Okay. Uh, how about bar barium's kind of a monster? Why? Because barium is way down here. Six level. All right, so let's use the shorthand for Barry. How many electrons? 56. 56. Okay, let's walk backwards to the nearest xenon, 54. And then we say, all right, so this is 6s2. That's it. Fifty-four plus two is fifty-six. So that's the shorthand for barium. Uh, europium. It's another deal. We're not going to mess with any of these down here. The reason being that they're kind of funky. I don't think we're dealing with Marshall Rays. No. Okay. Periodic trends. So looking at the periodic table, 
and uh, information on ionization energy. We'll take that one first. What happens is, as you go uh, from bottom to top within a group, the ionization energy increases. It takes it takes more energy to break the electron away. The ionization energy. You take your uh, neutral atom, and it produces uh, that one plus an electron. And you have to add energy to make it do that. And this is to add infinity, like we talked about before. It's completely removed. Now that ionization energy, this is first ionization energy, where you go from neutral to the first removal. You can also do that one and remove another one. That's second ionization energy. Okay. But for this trend, we're only talking about first ionization energies right now. Now, that's from uh, bottom to top, it increases. Ionization energy from left to right increases. It takes more energy as you go from left to right to remove an electron. Uh, so the trend for the whole table is from lower left to upper right, ionization energy increases. Okay. Electron affinity is, let's see, we've got a slide for that. Yeah, there's the ionization energy. So there's the first ionization, there's the second. You can even go third. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But I want to get these out of the way first. Uh, I'll come back to that. Come on. Come on. Uh, I need to reorder these things. All right, let's go back. Okay, we'll talk about electron affinity and atomic radius in a minute. So let's get this out of the way. Notice that uh, each time you remove another electron, the energy goes up, it increases, right? <clears throat> that is simply electrostatic attraction, right, for these two. These are the valence electrons, these first two. Remember, magnesium is in the second group, so it has two valence electrons. It's ready to give those up in a chemical reaction. But when you get down below those two, you're getting into the core. In other words, uh, for magnesium, we're removing those 2s, uh, 3s electrons. Once we get below that, we're into the structure that looks like neon, and we're starting to take away the neon's 2p electrons. They don't want to give them up. That's a full orbital, likes it that way. So it takes a lot more energy. To remove a core electron. Right? Valence versus core. Valence electrons are those in the outermost shell that uh, that are participate in the reaction. Core electrons, no. They're, they're stuck, they want to be there, they don't want to give up. You have to put a lot of energy in there to get them right, to move. Okay, why this trend? Well, let's see. Across the period from left to right, the ionization energy increases principally because you're adding effective nuclear charge. In other words, you're adding more protons. So they tend to draw the electrons closer. There's more electrostatic attraction for the electrons as you move from left to right. That explains the increase there. Um, but as you move uh, in the group, from top to bottom, say we went from bottom to top, increases ionization energy. But from top to bottom, ionization energy decreases. And the reason it decreases from top to bottom is you're adding energy levels further and further away. So that means they're already at a higher energy level. You just add and need less energy to get them off. Does that make sense? <laughs> Okay. Um, we're not going to spend time on this. So electron repulsion. Uh, let's see. Explain why. Now we don't need that. 
Uh, let's see, because we're running out of time. Which of these atoms uh, needs more energy to remove an electron? Well, I'm sorry? Yeah, chlorine. Right, because from left to right, it takes more. So you go from left, this is over farther to the right, so it takes more energy to remove that first electron. More. more. Yes. Right. How about this one? Now we're we're in the same group, lithium and cesium. So which one would take more energy? Lithium. Yeah, it's it's further up. Plus, the electron you're trying to remove is closer to the nucleus. And the other thing is, as you move farther away from the uh, nucleus with your electrons, the outer electrons, the inner electrons are shielding the nucleus from its effect on the outer electrons. So the effective nuclear charge is actually decreasing as you go from top to bottom. Let's say that again. So it's not more because cesium, cesium cesium has more protons than lithium, but it still takes more energy for lithium. Yes. That's for two reasons. The electrons in cesium are farther from the nucleus. Right? So the farther uh, two charges are apart, the less the attraction. And so those electrons are way out here versus lithium. Plus, cesium has a bunch of electrons in between the outer one and the nucleus. And those electrons shield the nucleus from this electron. So they decrease the amount of attraction that it would feel anyway. Okay. So as a general rule, can we do that for it? It goes from less to more as you go from mm -hmm. the back corner, so it's yes. closer to looking further. Lower left to upper right. Okay. Yeah. Now, okay. uh, these trends are, they work very well for the representative elements. That is, those in here and here. They tend to roller coaster right in here. <laughs> Just because um, D orbitals don't feel the same way as the S's and P's. How about second ionization energies for these? Lithium and beryllium. Okay. Lithium only has one valence electron. So its second ionization energy is going to be sky high. You're getting into the core. But the second ionization for beryllium is still removing a valence electron. So it's going to be lower. So lithium should have the highest second ionization energy. Oh, here's a chart. It's not in your book. It came out of my book. <clears throat> but your book probably has something similar to it. So you, you see here that this demarcates the uh, core electrons from the valence electrons for each of these elements. So as you increase the number of protons here and you're going across the period, what you're seeing is that the uh, you're getting into the core electrons for sodium in the second ionization, but it takes the third for magnesium and the fourth for aluminum and the fifth for silicon to get into the core. And you see the demarcation between energies here. Very pronounced when you get into the core electrons. Okay, electron affinity. Electron affinity is not the opposite of ionization. Electron affinity starts from the same place, the neutral atom, and then you measure how much energy does it give up when an electron is added to it to do that. And all this takes place in the gas phase. I should emphasize that. Why is it in the gas phase? because you don't want any other energy interactions to interfere with it. You want those uh, atoms to be separate from each other, which just means gas. If they were in a liquid or a solid phase, then you would have interatomic attractions that would 
mask the, uh, the true effect of adding an electron. So how much energy does it give up when one electron is added to it? That's, that's electron affinity. Okay? When you go from left to right, the electron affinities become more negative. What does that mean? Well, we have to go back to our convention. Right? What does it mean when an energy is negative? That means energy is leaving. Right? So when this electron comes from infinity down to the outermost orbital, this one, it gives off energy. Okay? So that means it's given off energy, the value is negative. So the more negative means that the electron affinity actually is, is higher in some respects as you move from left to right. It's more affinity for the electron as you move from left to right. Okay, that's what that means. If you go down a group, the affinity becomes more positive, which means it's less attracted to. So the attraction for electrons in a group, the attraction increases as you move higher. So the same trend, electron affinity, uh, is stronger, let's put it that way. Electron affinity is stronger as you go from lower left to upper right. Okay? Here we go. How about atomic radius? <clears throat> let's see, where are we going? Left to right? Okay, left to right, the atomic radius decreases. And that's primarily due to, you've got more protons. They're drawing those electrons in closer. And the atomic radius incorporates the extent of the electron cloud as well. So if you move from left to right, they're going to get smaller. Even though you've got more protons and more electrons, it draws them in. How about from, let's see, a down a group. The atomic radius as you go down a group increases. There's a simple explanation for that too. Notice that you're adding energy levels as you go down. So that means bigger. So as you go down a group, you're adding energy levels, you're ballooning the atom. So getting bigger, atomic radius should increase from upper right to lower left. Just the opposite of the, of the first two. Okay? Now notice uh, this representation of atomic radius skips over the uh, transition metals. That's because they do this thing. <laughs> So when we talk about those trends, we generally stick to the representative elements. So from the, in this group, they get bigger as you go down, and they get bigger from right to left. Okay. All right. How am I doing? I want to be sure I hit all the topics. We've got several more pages. Um, okay, we're in good shape. Which one of these should be larger? Well, they're in the same period, right? There's sodium, there's chlorine. So if the trend is right, chlorine should be smaller than sodium. So sodium should be the larger one. How about lithium and cesium? Okay, they're in the same group, up and down. So lithium's only got energy level two, cesium's up to six. So it ought to be the big one. Okay? How about this? Just, just stay with the 1s orbital. The innermost orbital for hydrogen is a certain size. 
Should lithium be larger or smaller? It should be smaller because lithium's got more protons. So it's drawing that, that orbital in. Come on, there we go. Hydrogen should be larger. Uh, which is lower in energy? Well, the one that's closer to the nucleus is lower in energy. So that means lithium. Right? At room temperature, the metallic element molybdenum exists as a solid crystal. Metallic crystals behave like a three-dimensional array of cations surrounded by a sea of electrons. A molybdenum crystal can be used to estimate the atomic radius of the molybdenum atoms. The distance between nuclear centers and molybdenum is 278 kilometers. So the atom radius is estimated to be 139 kilometers. Yeah, that never did sit well with me anyway. I don't know how they, how they can say that, because they're assuming that the spheres touch everywhere. They don't necessarily do that. So I guess the, the operative word there is estimated. At room temperature, the halogen element chlorine exists in the gas phase. Gas phase molecules are relatively far apart, since gases have low densities. Molecules move in straight lines until they collide with container balls for other molecules. The diatomic chlorine molecule can be used to estimate the atomic radius of chlorine atoms. The distance between nuclear centers and chlorine is 199 kilometers, so the atom radius is estimated to be 100 kilometers. Don't ask me how they do that. Probably takes some very expensive equipment. The halogen element chlorine exists in the gas. I don't need to hear that again. Okay. How about these uh, ionization energies? Let's arrange them in order from uh, lowest to highest. Oxygen, fluorine, sulfur. Okay, so there's oxygen, there's fluorine, and there's sulfur. So lower left to upper right should be sulfur, oxygen, fluorine. Yeah. Oh. Supposed to do that. <laughs> so atomic size should be just the opposite, right? Because the trends are opposite from one another. Okay. Uh, so you can read those if you want. I think what we're going to do is um, I'm going to let you. Play with the problems, solve those problems, and write down your questions. Next time we meet, we'll do a review, and we get into some stuff in the problems that we just barely touched on here. So I, I think there's going to be a whole lot more discussion once you bring the problems back and we talk about them. Okay. Now I'll, I'll post this probably this evening. Shut it down. <laughs>